To understand what's happening with Greece and the Eurozone, think about a dinner party. If you're cooking just for yourself and your spouse, it's easy. You make something you both like. But if you've got guests, things get harder. If you need to accommodate a vegetarian, and someone who's gluten-free, and someone with a soy allergy, your options get really limited. And that's the problem with Europe's idea of having a whole bunch of countries all use the same currency. So Greece's economy is in a disaster. A quarter of the population is unemployed, and it has this very high debt burden. Normally, if you've got really high unemployment, what happens is that a country makes its currency cheaper by printing extra money. That makes its products cheaper on world markets, it makes it a more attractive tourist destination, and it means that foreign investors can get great bargains. But if unemployment's really low, a country likes to have an expensive currency. That increases people's purchasing power, and it keeps prices down. And in Europe, you have a bunch of economies that are really different. A price of euros that's appropriate for Greece, where they have a 25% unemployment rate, is way too low for Germany, where the unemployment rate's below 5%. And Greece's problem is that it's small, poor, and geographically isolated from the rest of the Eurozone. It's like the only vegetarian at the barbecue, except when it comes to currencies, there's no side dishes. And so there's plenty of specific decisions we can second guess, plenty of things Greece did and various banks did that we can question. But fundamentally, having all these countries come to a dinner party with only one dish on the menu was a mistake. The Euro was a project that Europe set about on for really political reasons. It was a symbol of their determination to have peace on the continent. But they didn't really take the economics of it seriously. So Greece joins the Euro in 2001, and initially it works out great for Greece, because all of a sudden everyone was like, yeah, sure, let's, let's lend the money. Um, so they borrowed lots and lots and lots of Euros, except that didn't change the fact that their economy is a lot weaker than some of the other European countries. So to re really work, you would need a much, much, much closer union, where you had big financial transfers coming from the richer places to the poorer places all the time. In the United States, the poor states like Kentucky, Mississippi, Alabama, they're constantly getting money from the richer states like Massachusetts, California, New York, through the welfare system, through Social Security, through Medicare, through Medicaid. And, you know, people may sort of complain about this or that program, but we don't dispute the idea that it's all one country, so money's going to circulate around. Um, Europeans, you know, they just don't feel that way. Germans are willing to support poor German people, but they don't want to support Greek people with their tax dollars. So they're kind of like halfway integrated in a way that doesn't really work. What is the European debt crisis? It's the failure of the euro, the currency that ties together 17 European countries in an intimate but flawed manner. Over the past three years, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, and Spain have all teetered on the brink of financial collapse, threatening to bring down the entire continent and the rest of the world. How did it happen? Uniting Europe. For most of Europe's history, it's been at war with itself. And countries at war with each other tend to do less business together. Europe was always a continent of trade barriers, tariffs, and different currencies. Doing business across borders was difficult. You needed to pay a fee to exchange currencies. And you needed to pay a tariff fee to buy and sell to companies in other countries. That tended to stifle economic growth. Then came World War II, which devastated Europe. Because the situation was so dire, the fastest way to rebuild Europe was to begin to remove these barriers. Steel and coal tariffs came down, so that a steel mill in one country could sell to a builder in another. This gave the survivors an idea, a unified Europe, a union across the continent that would end all future wars. Countries began to band together toward this goal, bringing down trade barriers, lowering the cost of doing business. One of the last barriers to fall was the Berlin Wall. With a united Germany, Europe was ready. 27 countries signed the Maastricht Treaty and created the European Union. This made doing business across borders easier. But there was still one major obstacle, the different currencies. A decade later, they had won. The Euro, launched on January 1st, 
1999. Countries adopting the euro, called the euro area, discontinued their own currencies. They also discontinued their own monetary policies, giving control to the newly formed European Central Bank, commonly referred to as the ECB. The euro area now had one unified monetary policy, but it still had many different fiscal policies. A key reason for the current debt crisis. Monetary policy versus fiscal policy. You see, it's important to understand the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy controls the money supply, literally how much money there is in the economy and what the interest rates are for borrowing money. Fiscal policy controls how much money a government collects in taxes and how much it spends. The government can only spend as much as it collects in taxes. Anything above that amount, it has to borrow. This is called deficit spending. Before the euro, countries like Greece not only had to pay high interest rates to borrow, but they could only borrow so much. Lenders weren't comfortable lending them too much money. But now that they were part of the euro area's new united monetary policy, the amount they could borrow skyrocketed. Smaller countries suddenly had access to credit like never before. Greece and other countries, which previously could only borrow at rates around 18%, could now borrow for the same low rate as Germany. How? Germany's credit card. You see, joining the euro area is a lot like sharing a credit card. Germany's credit card. Lenders now believe that if Greece was unable to repay its loans, Germany and the other big economies of Europe would step in and repay them because they were now bound by a common currency. With a new abundance of cheap credit, Greece and other European countries were able to adjust their fiscal policies and increase spending to previously impossible levels. Some countries embarked on huge deficit spending programs, primarily for politicians to get elected. They made promises such as more jobs and generous pensions, all of it paid for with the new money they could now borrow. The governments of Greece, Portugal, and Italy accumulated huge debts. However, they were able to repay these debts with more borrowed money. As long as the borrowing continued, so did the spending and the unbalanced fiscal policies. In Ireland and Spain, cheap credit fueled enormous housing bubbles, just as it did in the United States. Credit flowed, debt accumulated, and the economies of Europe became tightly intertwined. Companies began opening factories and offices across Europe. German banks lending to French companies, French banks lending to Spanish companies, and so on and so forth. This made doing business incredibly efficient while at the same time tying together the collective fate of the euro area. Things continued this way as long as credit was available, and credit was available until 2008. Spurred by a collapse in the U.S. housing market, a credit crisis swept the globe, bringing borrowing to a halt everywhere. Suddenly, the Greek economy couldn't function. It couldn't borrow money to pay for all the new jobs and benefits it created. It couldn't borrow the new money it needed to pay its old debts. This was a problem for Greece, but because of the unified monetary policy, it was also a problem for all of Europe. Much of Europe had been on a spending spree and borrowed more money than it could ever repay. But the problem is somebody has to pick up the tab or else every country in the euro area will suffer. Since the countries that ran up the bill couldn't repay, everyone looked to Germany. Austerity measures. As the biggest and strongest economy in Europe, Germany reluctantly agreed to help bail out the debtor countries. In other words, Germany agreed to repay the bill, but only if the debtor countries agreed to implement strict austerity measures to ensure that it would never happen again. Austerity measures meant sucking it up cutting spending, borrowing less, and paying back more debt. This sounds like a simple solution, right? It's not. First of all, nobody wants austerity. Austerity means cutting government spending, 
And since the government is by far the biggest spender in any economy, when the government cuts spending, it cuts the earnings of many of its citizens. People lose jobs. They get angry. They riot in the streets. And austerity also doesn't automatically balance a country's budget. You see, the government collects taxes based on people's earnings. So when earnings are reduced, the government collects less in taxes. They still can't pay down their debts. The pain is so bad that it's almost politically impossible to accomplish. On top of that, there are huge cultural differences within the Euro area. Extreme Cultural Differences Germany is very financially responsible. Ever since the terrible hyperinflation the country experienced after World War I, it's been extremely inflation averse and incredibly careful about spending and borrowing. In general, Germans work hard, expect little in the line of state benefits, and meticulously pay all of their taxes. Many Greeks, on the other hand, enjoy generous state benefits and don't pay taxes. Greece has a terrible problem. It has never collected the majority of the taxes it imposes on its citizens. And it's always been this way. Joining the Euro just amplified it. The German view is, that doesn't work. If you want our money, you need our morals. As the debtor countries headed towards default, the whole continent of Europe was in danger. Even though the economies of the debtor countries are relatively small, they posed a huge threat because the European financial system is so interconnected, precisely because of the Euro. Remember, the debtor countries borrowed money from banks, investors, and other governments throughout Europe. As the debtor countries get closer to default, everyone who lent them money becomes weaker, and everyone who lent those lenders money also becomes weaker, and so on and so forth. A problem in one country could reverberate across the whole continent, triggering a chain reaction of default. If Greece defaults, then Spain could default. Italy, Portugal, and Ireland could be next. Then France, then Germany. Pretty soon, it could spread not just across Europe, but across the world. Fiscal union or breakup. The problem is, even if the debtor nations adopt austerity measures, and even if the bailout from Germany and the stronger countries helps them pay down their debts and avoid the immediate crisis, there's no system in place to prevent this from happening again. This brings us back to that fundamental division of monetary policy and fiscal policy. Ultimately, the Euro area requires a fiscal union to match its monetary union, or neither. That is, there must be a political organization with authority to set fiscal policy within every Euro area country. It must have the power to cut spending, raise taxes, and set laws. A fiscal union like this could actually prevent excessive borrowing and spending. However, this is an enormously complicated and unpopular notion. It means surrendering sovereignty to a higher power. In essence, a United States of Europe. Yet, without a centralized fiscal union, countries will continue to run deficits, accumulate debt, degrade the value of the euro, and threaten the stability of Europe. Can Europe take the necessary steps and create a fiscal union alongside the monetary union? Or will the monetary union break up and the euro disappear? Greece is currently about $400 billion in debt. 
That's about 170% of their annual gross domestic product. Over the next 50 years, they are scheduled to repay that, but with the economy in shambles, many experts wonder if that goal is feasible. But how did Greece end up with so much debt in the first place, and to whom specifically does Greece owe money? Greece became somewhat politically and economically unstable back in the 1970s after an attempted government coup. Nevertheless, after a profit spike in the 1990s, they made the fiscal requirements to join the Eurozone in the year 2000. This event inextricably tied Greece to stronger economies like Germany and France, and allowed Grecians more access to low-interest loans. So, public spending and government borrowing soared, even as Greece's debt remained higher than the Eurozone average in the 2000s. When the international recession of 2008 hit, Greece spiraled into a debt crisis. To make matters worse, in 2009, it was revealed that Greece had been falsifying reports on their debt for years. When the real statistics were exposed, their national credit rating took a plunge, which in turn caused investors to jack up interest rates. Greece has been on the brink of bankruptcy ever since. German Chancellor Angela Merkel later said that Europe should not have accepted Greece into the Eurozone. Out of the roughly $300 billion in bailout money that Greece must eventually pay back, most of it, or about 47%, is due to the European Financial Stability Facility. This is a temporary organization created by Eurozone members to pool money and help stabilize member countries in crisis. Greece, Portugal, and Ireland are the primary recipients of the EFSF. 19% of Greece's debt is held by other Eurozone governments, another 12% is held by private investors, and the rest, about 22%, is held by the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and Treasury bill holders, who are primarily Greek banks. Yet, after all the financial help, Greece remains in trouble. The unemployment rate for those aged 15 to 24 is at 55%. Further, budget cuts are so unpopular that they have led to riots and protests. Meanwhile, Greece and other European governments are locked in heated dispute as to whether Greece should or even could make more financial reforms. Germany and France, who have invested nearly $115 billion in the country, don't want to see Greece default on its debt, but they are also refusing to give Greece another bailout. During the next half century, Greece needs to stimulate its economy while decreasing government spending. In the end, most experts agree that Greece will not be allowed to go bankrupt. The financial loss for other Western countries, including the United States, would be too great and could potentially create another international recession. The roots of the financial crisis go back to 2001, when Greece adopted the euro and became part of the eurozone. That gave them access to billions in loans at low interest rates. The government used the money to finance dozens of projects and reforms to try to modernize the country and put it on par with its new European partners. Greece also grossly overspent on dozens of non-essential projects like the Athens Olympics, which helped fuel inflation. Greek leaders were sure their economy would grow enough to pay the loans, but every year they spent more than they collected. Also, a Greek tradition of widespread tax evasion, especially among the rich, a sprawling bureaucracy and rampant corruption helped to throw the deficit out of control. Greece wasn't the only country in this deficit bind. The finances of other European countries were growing worse by the day, while their leaders looked away and largely ignored the rules they wrote. To make matters far worse, the Greek government had been cooking the books. They'd been presenting false or incomplete financial data to European regulators for years. And then the U.S. financial crisis hit Europe, throwing it into a recession and revealing the deep weaknesses of the economies of Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. Greece felt the crisis more than the others. High inflation kept tourists away and with them a much needed source of income for millions of Greeks. Other big industries like shipbuilding lost customers and investors. A new government came to power in 2009, promising to spend and reboot the economy. But soon they discovered their debts were much higher than they thought. In the next act of the Greek crisis, by early 2010, it was clear Greece was running out of money to pay its debts. The layoffs and cuts to benefits didn't sit well with powerful unions and the large sector of state workers.
As an anti-austerity party takes power in Greece, a serious confrontation looms between the new government and its Eurozone creditors, throwing into question the stability of this troubled economic union. In this installment, we're counting down 10 crucial facts you should know about the Greek debt crisis. Number 10. When did the crisis begin? The United States entered into a recession in 2007 after the collapse of its subprime mortgage industry, which prompted a worldwide economic downturn known as the Great Recession. Securities backed by these subprime mortgages had been traded worldwide and infected markets globally. European governments were forced to bail out their banking systems, which held a lot of these assets on their books. These bailouts, combined with existing high levels of government debt throughout Europe, sparked doubt among investors as to whether European governments could successfully refinance their debt loads, which ultimately led to the European sovereign debt crisis. Data for France showed the PMI there recording its biggest fall since the index began 14 years ago. By 2009, it had become clear that some Eurozone countries would require assistance from external institutions in order to manage their debt, and one of these nations was Greece. Number 9. What were the underlying causes of the crisis? Since the mid-70s, the Greek government had been running a deficit funded by issuing government bonds. The introduction of the European Common Currency, the Euro, in 1999 created a situation in which all European bonds were considered the same, meaning Greece would pay significantly less interest on the bonds it issued. This encouraged Greece to continue disastrously excessive deficit spending, with the country's government even making arrangements with financial institutions like Goldman Sachs to conceal their true level of borrowing. At the same time, the Greek government consistently failed to collect all of the taxes that were owed to them. This, combined with a large public sector, kept Greek government spending high and pushed Greek's debt-to-GDP ratio to 146 percent by 2010. Number 8. How did the crisis evolve? The economic crisis in Greece was exacerbated in April 2010 when the credit rating agency Standard & Poor downgraded Greece's credit rating to junk status, meaning it was not worthy of investment. This effectively closed off private capital markets to Greece as a source for borrowing money. International financial service agencies like Standard & Poor continuously monitor a country's credit worthiness, which in turn determines what interest rate a country's bonds should yield. By June 2011, Greece's credit rating had dropped to triple C, the lowest credit rating in the world, and the country's interest rates shot back up to pre-euro rates. Greece earned this triple C rating due to the belief that it might actually default on its debt obligations, essentially meaning that the country would declare bankruptcy. Number 7. What was the response to the crisis? Facing the prospect of default, by mid-2010, Greece entered into loan agreements with a group of creditors consisting of other Eurozone countries, the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank, which was nicknamed the Troika. The first loan package was agreed to on May 2, 2010, to the tune of 110 billion euros. Due to extreme circumstances, the European Union met in July 2011 to structure a second loan package of 109 billion euros. Then, in October 2011, Eurozone leaders and the International Monetary Fund came to a joint agreement with banks in order to write off 50% of Greece's debt over the next nine years, in a plan to reduce the country's debt to 120% of GDP by 2020. Number 6. What were the conditions of Greece's loans? Greece was forced to implement severe austerity measures in return for receiving loans from the Troika. This included significant spending cuts, public sector salary and pension cuts, and the privatization of national industries. These measures were met with public resistance in the form of widespread protests and a general nationwide strike. Uh. Masked protesters clashed with police on the streets of major cities, hurling petrol bombs, with some confrontations leading to several deaths and hundreds of injuries. In 2012, the IMF admitted that they did not foresee the overall impact of the austerity measures, which actually worsened the Greek recession. Violent riots erupted in the Greek capital of Athens throughout that year. 
Number five, what were the consequences of austerity? There is a revolution against the government. The austerity measures held deep ramifications for Greece and severe consequences for its citizens. As of February 2015, unemployment hovered around 26%, and for those under the age of 25, that number peaked as high as 50%. About a third of the population had, by that point, sunk below the poverty line. Greece had the highest child poverty rate in Europe, with nearly 40.5% of children trapped in impoverished circumstances. Furthermore, a study found that after every new round of austerity measures was enforced, suicide rates in men and women increased by 12% to 36% and remained high. The conditions that the Troika requested in return for bailing out the Greek economy were so harsh that it prompted one United Nations official to speculate that they constituted human rights violations. Number 4. How has the crisis affected Europe? Greece was set to receive a final batch of funding on February 28, 2015. However, Greece's recently elected left-wing government had proclaimed its desire to halt austerity and renegotiate the terms of its debt, even suggesting that a new round of debt forgiveness would be necessary. German Chancellor Angela Merkel signaled that more loans would not be extended to Greece, nor would any more of its debt be forgiven. By that point, it was likely that, if an agreement were not reached, Greece would default on its debt and exit the Eurozone. That theoretical event would likely cause a ripple effect that would see other indebted countries choosing to leave their debts and the Eurozone behind, causing the complete breakdown of the Eurozone with dire economic consequences for every European country. Number 3. Who is in charge now? The problem it's not just, just, just Greek, it's a European problem. Greece is a part of the Eurozone, and the problem of debt of Greece is a part of a, of a, of a bigger European problem. On January 25, 2014, Alexis Tsipras, the leader of Greece's leftist political party, the Coalition of the Radical Left, or Syriza as it's commonly known, became the new Prime Minister of Greece. Tsipras was part of the Greek Communist Youth Organization in the 1980s and in the 90s rose to political prominence as a leader of the student movement. Soon after the new government was formed, discussions began between Greece's new finance minister Yanis Varoufakis and Europe's financial officials. Varoufakis toured Europe drumming up support for Syriza's anti-austerity and debt negotiation platform, upon which they had campaigned and won the support of the Greek electorate. Varoufakis managed to gain a sympathetic ear from many in Europe, most notably the French, but the Germans remained steadfast in their refusal to entertain his proposals. Number 2. What is the new government's vision? The new Greek finance minister devised a plan to end the country's austerity measures while also cutting Greece's debt. Greece would swap the outstanding debt for new growth-linked bonds. This new plan came in the wake of his previously stated goal, which was to spearhead a write-off of Greece's foreign debt. This previous plan was unacceptable to Germany and other creditor countries due to the fact that it implied a loss to taxpayers in their countries. Varoufakis's overarching message was that the original loans extended to Greece were completely irrational to begin with. His argument was that in 2010, Greece effectively became insolvent, and the Eurozone's response was to extend and pretend, meaning they extended more loans to the country while pretending that there was a realistic possibility that they could be repaid. Number 1. How will the Greek people move forward? Varoufakis, a former economics professor at the University of Athens, chose to play hardball with the European Union making drastic proposals that he knew would attract a lot of media attention. His strategy was considered risky, and it remains unclear if it will be effective. The Greek government will not negotiate with the Troika, only with official partners. There was widespread recognition among economists that there was no real possibility of Greece ever repaying its entire debt. In order to keep the Eurozone intact, the European Union will likely reach a compromise that would involve extending the February deadline, while also extending the period when Greece's debt repayments would be due, and offering a lower or even 0% interest rate. Syriza, for their part, will likely try to stay true to their vision of social justice, providing aid to those Greeks hit hardest by austerity measures. 
Greece is running out of money again. While the new prime minister is trying to convince Europe the country will pay its debts, Greek citizens aren't as confident. Bank deposits in Greece have tanked. It would seem that individuals and corporations aren't sure their money is safe in the bank and are depositing it abroad, or stuffing their mattresses. Private banks aren't the only institutions struggling to stay solvent. The Greek state owes a lot of money. Greece's debt as a percentage of GDP is huge, near 180%, by far the highest in the Eurozone. Making it worse, Greece's GDP is falling again after a brief uptick, and unemployment has stopped improving. The economy had a period of improvement in 2014, but the election of a new government has given the financial markets the jitters. Jitters that can be seen in the yield of the 10-year Greek government bond. Yields started rising again last year, and that indicates investors are less confident that Greece will be able to pay off its debt over the long term. So who pays if Greece does default? European governments will take the biggest hit. They own 62% of Greece's debt. The private sector claims 17% and the IMF 10%. All could lose billions if Greece doesn't pay back its loans. It's gonna be a civil war. There is a revolution against the government. People say that if they continue all this, we have to buy Kalashnikov. The EU demanded austerity. The Greek parliament voted for it. The streets erupted. And in the aftermath, Greeks were stunned. It's not the scale of the violence and destruction, but the scale of the uncertainty. Nobody knows how the economy can be rebuilt and the politics are fragmenting. In a normal crisis, a decisive vote in Parliament, a massive riot and the torching of 17 buildings might bring catharsis. But this is no normal crisis. Greece now faces maybe a decade of austerity and few among the political class believe the plan will work. And it seems to many Greeks that the more austerity and chaos they inflict on themselves, the more the big powers of Europe ask for. In the gritty streets of the port district of Piraeus, they know what it means when you make one in five people unemployed and cut health spending and slash the minimum wage. <laughs> This clinic, run by volunteer doctors and nurses, was originally set up to treat migrants. Now, one in three patients are Greek, like this woman who's a cleaner who's lost her job. I'm here to get food and some vaccinations for my children. Why can't you access the main Greek health, health service? We're not insured. My husband doesn't work, and I don't work. In the latest round of austerity, the government has lopped another billion euros off the medicines budget. Meanwhile, incomes are collapsing. If uh, you are poor, you have the same problems regardless if you come from Africa, Asia, or if you are a Greek citizen. But uh, for our organization, it's a, a whole new phenomenon to have Greeks. Because in the past, these people could uh, struggle for their daily life. Uh, it was, they had some problems but they could uh, manage it. Now the burden has become more, it's more difficult for them. If in the past it was difficult for them to find a job, now it's impossible for them. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, with the crisis the phenomenon will become worse. As the crisis deepens, the weakest and the poorest suffer, nowhere more so than those who are not supposed to be in Greece at all. This is Patras, the ferry port that links Greece to Western Europe. Right on the seafront, hundreds of illegal migrants live in this shattered factory. I'm taken in by an activist from a local NGO. The migrants got here because government cutbacks have made the Greek border highly porous. 
How easy is it to get into Greece? How oh, easy? It's too easy. It's too easy. Too easy. Why? Why? Because you know the the borders not closed. The borders are open. They survive on charity. They receive no assistance at all from the Greek state. But as the economy has collapsed, so too has sympathy for the migrants. You know, there's no Europe. Believe me, there's no Europe. It doesn't feel like no, Europe. No, no. Why? No, I used to live in London. There's no Europe. Believe me, there's no look like Europe. The police can hit you. The people can swear you for no reason. The people hit us like animal. What's the, what's the life there? This man, a graduate from Darfur, is headed for London. He can't wait to see the back of Greece. How long have you been in this factory place? Uh, in the factory here, I have uh, 60 months and three months in the train there. Yeah, yeah you lived before in the we came here because the police is for forced us to leave the train. Then we came here in the abandoned factory. I have 60 months here now. Do you think the economic crisis has made the situation for migrants worse? Yes. Why? Tell me. Uh, we are going to the market, so I think they that give you some food at the end. Some foods and uh, also the some money, you know. And like, that's there's yeah. less now. Yeah. Now the situation is changing because of the economic crisis. They drink from a pipe in the ground. Some have died from fires lit to keep warm. It's shocking to see this in a continent that once prided itself on a social model, but the crisis yeah. has turned so much of Greece upside down. For Greek youth, the situation too looks dire. 50% of those under 24 are unemployed. And among them, the extremes of politics are growing. In a bar run by one of the far left groups, I meet the people who've got together to feed and clothe the migrants. None is actually a member of a left party. All intend to vote for one. And all have been participants in disorderly protests. Um, there's no future for us. Generally, there is no future, we can't uh, dream, we can't live. Uh, for us, this is a disaster. But I've been hearing young Greek people say that to me for three years now. What do you do about it? Uh, we're fighting, we're trying to convince other people and uh, to make them understand that uh, uh, all this crisis is uh, a result of the capitalist system. Do you seriously think there could be a left-wing government in Greece? I don't think uh, it's going to be a non-violent uh, government from the left is going to be a civil war. In a way that the carpenter, the teacher, the engineer, the social worker, these are professional people, but the ideas they're espousing have become commonplace. And what it's about is work. There isn't any. If there is no war, there is a revolution against the government. <laughs> The Greek left, the communists, Trotskyists and ecologists now have a combined poll rating of 43.5%. This country always had a strong left wing. Now it's strong enough to have their own TV studios. And if there's an election, a previously unthinkable prospect. We are talking about a new block of forces which have their internal differences, but on the other hand, agree on the rejection of the new memorandum and this suffocating policy of super austerity. Do you think those forces could form a government? This is our proposal to them. These forces must put aside their uh, partial differences and after the next elections, yes, form a, a new block of power. In truth, the left is probably too splintered to attempt to form a government, but the general atmosphere of despair leads some politicians to call for the elections to be postponed. If we have elections so fast, we will have elections again in two more months and elections again in the next more months. And you know, we can kiss the country goodbye and we can kiss possibly the euro goodbye. The backbone of Greek capitalism is the small firm. At this one, with six workers, three are on short time, and the business plan is, well, just to survive. Now they face new taxes, endemic corruption, rising crime, and the owner detects a nostalgia among his peers for the days of military rule. Old people, old people, be thinking about the military government. For us, it's finished. But uh, they have one right, one right. They didn't 
still they stole even one penny. They didn't steal they a penny. Stole. Even just one of those which is still alive, he lives in one room. Places like this should be the bedrock of support for the centre-right, but they're not. I'm talking always to my children and say that to my children, OK, do not do not nothing, but you don't go just to for vote or go for vote. Just say that you are bastards. Just in one, two thousand, ten thousand that we are bastards, we come out to the Europe that all the Greek people say the politician bastards. That's what you told them. Yeah. You spoil your vote. Yeah. You don't trust any of them. No, no one. Do you think democracy will survive? We like to believe that we will survive. We like to believe. But if uh, the people say that if they continue all this, we have to buy Kalashnikov. There are still days when the sun shines and the old lifestyle rekindles and people forget their worries. But for the political class that's tried to guide Greece through this mess, there's deep concern. If we're not seriously looking at the repercussions, we may end up Russia of the early 90s, the very, very high poverty line. Russia in the mid 90s had a poverty line which was higher than than during communist period. And it had crooks running the country. And it had crooks running the country. Whatever happens next week, those remain the stakes, and they are high. The Vrionis family doesn't want to complain. They're getting by, and compared to most Greeks, they're doing well. Aside from their younger son, who's still a student, everyone has work. <laughs> Nikos, for instance, is a computer scientist, but his full-time job only pays minimum wage, about 500 euros. Now that I'm not studying in Patras anymore, and I'm back in Athens, I'm living with my parents again. If things were different and we didn't have the crisis, I could afford my own apartment. But I can't right now. His mother is a teacher and his father is a school principal. Wages have been cut and the family now has 30% less money. We have to save wherever we can, even if it's not visible. For instance, we buy less heating oil in winter. We've stopped buying new clothes. And we don't go out as much as we used to. The Vrionises are paying off their apartment, and they have two cars. It's not worth selling one of them. They wouldn't get enough for it. This car needs repairs, but our other car also needs fixing, and that's more urgent. I'm taking it to the garage now. The muffler rattles. And the door locks don't work. But the mechanic is an old friend of the family, and that makes the repairs more affordable. He gives Dinos a good price. Usually, it would all cost 180 euros. But for Dinos, I'll do it for 80 euros. But that's still a lot of money. After taxes, mortgage and other running costs, the family has just 400 euros a month to pay for food and clothing. My husband and I work a lot, and we work hard, and we're very reliable. I absolutely reject the accusations from the rest of Europe that we threw our money out the window. That claim has made us furious. The Vrionis family is also saving money by buying less meat than they did before the crisis, like most of this shop's customers. The butcher's sales have dropped sharply. He says austerity, though, will not save the economy. There's no question that we must pay all our debts, but that has to be made possible for us. We can't pay our debts under these strict conditions. A taverna can't make a profit when it's missing knives and forks. They've taken away our knives and forks. 
The Briones' younger son, Theodorus, is home only during the semester breaks. He studies in another city. His parents can still support him, but many of his friends have been badly affected by the crisis. I know students who only get 20 euros a week. That's really not a lot. Sometimes they don't even have enough to eat. I've been a teacher for 20 years. The young people have become more worried in recent years, more restless, but also more mature. Today they understand things that in the past people their age wouldn't have understood, but they're more pessimistic about the future. As so often happens, the crisis is the main story on the evening news. Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras has backed down in order to keep Greece in the Eurozone. Politics are always complicated and promises aren't kept. Everyone knows that. So you have to focus your attention on what's really important. We're waiting for things to get better. And it's clear to everyone here that improvements are not going to happen overnight. If Greece were to exit the Eurozone, a scenario dubbed the Grexit, what would happen? First, the Euro would be taken out of circulation in Greece and the drachma reintroduced. Its value would immediately start to drop, at first by about 40% with much more to come. That would slash drachma-denominated debt, mostly held by Greek banks. The debt owed to Eurozone creditors would still have to be paid back in Euros. But the weaker the drachma, the harder that would be. It could easily become impossible. The Greek government could start printing more drachmas, which would only devalue the currency even more. The ratings agencies would classify Greece as in default. Greece would be cut off from any further credit from international money markets. But at least holidays in Greece would be incredibly cheap. Foreigners would be able to buy vacation houses for next to nothing. Greek exports would also be dirt cheap. The problem here is there are not enough attractive products to support the economy. The Greeks, for their part, would no longer be able to afford medicines from abroad, and many imports would only be available on the black market. Most of the Greek savings would be deposited in foreign banks. While Greek banks would be struggling to stay afloat, Greek companies could no longer pay outstanding bills in euros and might have to close shop putting even more people out of work. That might trigger social unrest. Professionals, doctors, specialists and academics would leave Greece. And the European Union would still have to send aid to Greece, which would, after all, still be an EU member. It's a Greek tragedy in the making.